I would like to introduce Andrew Mackay, who is our head of mobility technology for Asia Pacific Japan, and he will be presenting on 5G monetization enablers, status and evolution of new use cases. Thanks, Chair, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm not sure how many of you were here for the, the same event uh, last year. I think I've done it three years in a row. So I was really, um, I was really thinking this year. You know, where are we at with 5G? You know, what's the uh, the relevance um, in terms of what are the relevant topics? And you have heard a lot uh, about monetization. Um, last year we talked a lot about sort of the overall architecture. Um, you know, now it's become very real. We do have our first 5G networks actually live carrying commercial traffic uh, in North America. And we've got imminent launches uh, in Korea uh, coming up. They were meant to be launched by now. They've had a few delays in terms of terminal availability and things like that. So it has become real. There's real money gone into uh, 5G networks. So I thought it was timely to give a bit of an update on the business case. Um, that operators are moving forward with and how that's linking uh, to the network. Uh, so my focus is very much in the core of the network. So architecture, uh, packet core, the service enablers around that, and access, of course. The packet core now is a, um, a multi-access part of the network, whether it be uh, Wi-Fi, uh, licensed technologies, 3G, 4G, 5G, uh, and increasingly with fixed mobile convergence, uh, the two worlds are also coming together. So my agenda today is a little bit of a refresher. I know you've heard it millions of times, but just, you know, where is that focus? Where's the business focus for 5G? Um, and then those phases I've talked about that we're already seeing at the ready. This first phase around what I'm just calling opening up the pipe. So enhance mobile broadband if you want to use that term, but what is the, the money and what is happening in the network to achieve that? Uh, the second, slicing. Slicing is an overused word. I tend to, in the presentation, talk about custom services, or basically being able to customise services for certain segments uh, or certain applications. And then the third one, which is a little bit further out uh, for most of us, is the move to the edge. Uh, a lot of talk about MEC, uh, multi-access edge compute. Um, so I want to give you an update on the status of that, um, and then my colleague um, Santanu, straight after this, will do a bit more of a deep dive on that. Uh, so a little bit of a refresher. What are, what are we going to get out of 5G? Effectively, um, I think last year, our, our real key message is 5G is much more than radio. Uh, new radio does give us some more service capabilities around bandwidth, uh, particularly uh, some network changes are going to give us lower uh, latency, yes, but some of the most interesting business concepts come on the right-hand side here. When we start to look at cloud agility, API programmability, and probably most importantly, what everyone's looking at now in terms of CFOs is just the cost per bit reduction that 5G can achieve, and what can they do with that uh, in the market. Uh, depending on the, the status of SPs in their market, whether they're a challenger, a tier one, whether they're very enterprise focused, very consumer focused, prepaid, postpaid, uh, there are different strategies about going to market around mobile broadband, fixed wireless access, uh, M2M, IoT kind of uh, use cases, uh, or looking at new sort of network as a service models as well, which I will uh, go into a bit more. Um, but ultimately, when it comes to the segments, everyone's pretty universally agreed that the focus for 5G is shifting over the right-hand side of the slide. Um, this is a pretty saturated market in terms of ARPUs. Um, you know, the, the, if you look at the global economics, there's only so much that consumers are willing to spend on their telecommunications, and that's pretty much being saturated. So they want more for the same, uh, it's in these areas here that very much the focus of Cisco Live in general in terms of bringing enterprise vertical um, partners and uh, end users together with service providers. Okay, so 5G it itself, the way I look at it is, yes, it's more of the same in terms of mobile broadband, um, but the 5G vision is a bit uber. It's a bit about taking a lot of the bespoke networks that are out there today, the private networks that have been designed for a specific use case, you know, the machine to machine, um, more of the critical kind of infrastructure, and bringing them together. So bringing them together into one framework uh, in terms of a technology 
even though they have very diverse requirements. You know, some not needing the high bandwidth, others needing low latency around that. So it's going to be a, a very, uh, let's say that, you know, an uber vision, but within that is the devil in the detail about how we achieve these outcomes. So the bottom line message is today's 4G networks um, are not going to cut the mustard. There are many Achilles heels in the architecture and there are many choke points uh, in, um, through that pipe today. So for those of you who were here last year, this is kind of the vision we set forward. And I think I have to, you know, I, I now realize we've, we've sort of, you know, left a bit of a gap in terms of how we get there. So the future state was what looks like this, and this is what you would do today if you had the luxury of building a greenfield network. And you'll hear a bit more about this from Centano after me about starting from scratch, cloud agility, a uh, very distributed network, a very virtualized network, um, aspects around the RAN decomposing and centralizing, the core doing the same, coming together at some point in the network around where the new edge is. Uh, you'll hear from my friend Promode later on about how that required a new security architecture. Rather than just protecting the edge of the network, we've actually got new threat services right through the network. Um, and ultimately, to manage all this huge complexity, all these dynamic workloads, we need a network fabric um, and a data center fabric underneath that to make it happen. So this was the vision. Um, what I reflect on is how many of us in the room actually have the luxury of building a greenfield network. Like I expect it's no one possibly in the room today. So the reality is we've all got networks we manage. Um, they've got a you know a 3G, 4G legacy. So how is it that we're going to take a brownfield network and introduce these capabilities in a stepwise way? And how are we going to get this, keep the CFOs happy? that in each of those steps they have a valid business case and they have ROI around that. So that's where I'm going to go through these uh, three steps. So from a business perspective, what I see um, is the first one today is very much this top line, it's just branding. Um, the reality is everyone has to do 5G, right? Because if you don't, you're signaling to your, uh, you know, to your, your customer base, but also your um, stockholders and your investors that you are not a technology company. Everyone's talking 5G. Why are you as a service provider not planning and having a strategy for 5G? So, that, so it's just a given. So we have to do something. On the bottom line, the CFOs are going, well, if we're going to do something, let's at least get some return on investment. And that return on investment is very much about cost per bit reduction. Okay? And, it, and it's a pretty, pretty simple piece of math to say that the biggest cost in my network is my passive infrastructure. It's all my cell sites and all my real estate. If I have more spectrum, I can pump more bits through that infrastructure, so my cost per bit has to come down. What I do with that, whether it's going to hit my bottom line or whether I'm actually going to go to market with more aggressive offerings of, or, or not. And I'll talk more about that and I'll give you some sort of early thoughts around how the cost per bit will come, come down with 5G. The second phase is that mention uh, in the introduction about shifting to the right. So what is it to go after those enterprise and vertical markets? What do they require? What do they want? What are the challenges they have in their business? And how am I going to design a, a network that not only meets those requirements that they might be serving through a bespoke network today, how am I going to enable that? So network as a service type models. Um, and then on the bottom line here, as I start to make my network a bit more dynamic, yeah, um, traffic breakout, you know, concepts around path optimization, slicing and caching uh, come to play as well. And then the, vi the vision, which everyone talks about, perhaps about 5G, is, all, is these new sexy use cases, AR, VR, I think you heard it in the keynote, you know, um, remote surgery and autonomous cars. I'm a little bit you know, as an engineer, thinking that that's great, but we've got a long journey to go down to get those capabilities into our networks. So that's why I put those as phase three. And ultimately, we want to get to a point where our operational model meets that reality. Everything's moving at cloud speed. We have CI, CD uh, right through the network, right through the lifecycle management in that as well. So let me walk through these phases. Um, graphically, what they look like. 
fat pipe, um, taking today's network, bolting it on so that we've got enhanced mobile broadband to smartphones, uh, potentially bolting on or um, a parallel network or an integrated network for some new fixed wireless access uh, type use cases as well. Um, the second one, I, I'm starting to avoid the word slicing, but you know, it's about these differentiated services. You know, today's networks are very vanilla. In fact, you know, typically an APN follows exactly the same path right through the network until it gets out to the SGI uh, with some very primitive quas control. That's about it, right? That it's not able to customize really around bandwidth. Uh, latency, certainly not. Resiliency, no. Anywhere in that path, that all that infrastructure has the same resility. Uh, and security, no. Um, you know, concepts, I tell people, what if you could design your infrastructure so that your prepaid users who are on, you know, WhatsApp free plans or whatever, actually had a lower resiliency network? You know, imagine the cost savings you could get out of your infrastructure. Yet your premium users and your enterprises and things, you could actually provide an even higher resiliency. So it's not five nines everywhere, it might be four nines for some and six nines for other. That would be an amazing business proposition if we, as engineers, we could actually achieve that. Uh, and the third one is edge, you know, and the whole opportunity around edge is massive, um, but we have to think about you know, what are the economics, what are the true use cases, what are the true business models that are going to support that investment. Okay, so let's kick into phase one. Um, everyone wants to know, well, most people want to know, is 5G uh, fixed wireless access going to be cheaper than fiber? And it r pens. Like today, I think um, Australian market, particularly uh, certainly my home market, uh, New Zealand as well, and in the US, there's very defined economics about fiber to the X. How far to go? I mean, if you look at MBN, you know they know how far to go, and then it then it goes to wireless. It goes to to 4G today. 5G is going to bring that barrier back. Um, that's, that's just a given. If you can provide, you know, 10 gig a bit speeds to residential households over wireless, if they could do it today, they would, but they just don't have the technology and spectrum in 4G. Um, so this is one study. There's so many factors in terms of household density, in terms of what infrastructure you have for hanging rights. Do you have, um, you know, overhead power distribution or is it underground? You know, is it street light poles? massively affect the business case. Um, but in this particular study, they're, they're talking about 5G um, connectivity roughly 50% cheaper than, than GPON, than fiber, for a res reasonably dense sort of residential deployment. Uh, if you go to a metro area, actually the, the, what they're predicting is the savings are even higher, which is kind of counterintuitive, because you, you would think that when uh, density goes up and fiber availability goes up, that wireless would be uh, less of a factor. But the, but the issue ultimately is, is the CPE, is actually getting into the premise and the advantages of having a wireless CPE and a self-install model um, without needing a truck roll massively impacts the business case. So there is a business case there. Um, Everyone is very interested in, in seeing how it pans out, and um, you know we're certainly learning through our, uh, with our North American customers, particularly Verizon and AT&T, uh, as they've gone live with these deployments. Um, you know what sort of user experience they get, and more importantly, what sort of economics. Okay, so let's look at the network. Let's say we're going to start with just this fatter pipe model. What do we have to consider? Uh, we certainly obviously have to consider the new radios, you know, there's new frequency bands, whether it be C-band, millimeter wave, uh, what's the RF propagation, do we need to infill sites, massive MIMO, all these sort of characteristics. Uh, we need to look at the backhaul impacts just purely from a capacity perspective, um, and that will be um, covered in sessions tomorrow around what's happening in the transport. Uh, in terms of the packet core, we've already well down the path of virtualizing the packet core, but the issue becomes capacity. So if we are pumping 10, 20 times more, um, more 
data through our access, can the packet core, even though it's virtualized, actually scale? And what are the economics of scaling? So I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and we need to drive a lot more automation. Um, and again, that's the topic of a session tomorrow. Um, Spectrum, so um, Australia is one of only two uh, countries to already have 5G uh, spectrum allocated. Um, Korea was probably the most progressive or first out of the blocks regulator. Um, and the great thing about Korea is they actually allocated the millimeter wave uh, and the, uh, the C band simultaneously, which is very good for the operators because they can plan their whole investment in their network in unison. Uh, Japan's just going through its beauty contest at the moment, so that will, I think, in the next couple of months, they'll also be allocated. Um, what do you see, though, for the countries that don't do simultaneous allocations, like Australia, actually, interestingly, New Zealand's going to be the other way around, is it means that those use cases are going to come at different times. So where the millimeter wave comes, fixed wireless access becomes very much a, an interesting use case. Uh, where it's C-band, it's more the, the smartphones and the enhanced, uh, what we call non-standalone mode, so you're just putting aggregate 5G capacity on top of the existing LTE. Um, so Spectrum is critical. This is what we need to track so that we know our timing and we also know how much bandwidth is going to be pumping through our networks. In terms of the air interface, um, again, if you were in the keynote, Irving mentioned this as well, there are really, or there are, only two ecosystems that exist anymore, unfortunately. Uh, it'd be nice if there were more. The 3GPP one, um, and we mustn't, we mustn't forget that we've got the cellular I IoT technologies also coming online at the moment. So they kind of get lost in the 5G hype, um, but we are only just introducing things like MBIoT, and LTE CAT M technologies. At the same time, we need to consider the, the 5G new radio. On the IEEE side, uh, now branded Wi Fi 6, this is a pretty exciting technology. It's um, basically taking Wi Fi today, there's a little bit of extra spectrum coming. The, um, the 5 gig unlicensed band is going to expand up to, to 6 gigs. Um, but the main advantage of Wi-Fi is they're finally introducing scheduling. So it looks very similar to an LTE or 5G ear interface. And that means that, that uh, in, in situations like this, I was in the, the convention center trying to get Wi-Fi, it was awful. You know, there was no, too many SSIDs, uh, there's obviously no quads, there's no prioritization. I would never be able to hold a voice over Wi-Fi call in there, it would never work. With Wi-Fi 6 bringing in scheduling, we can start to bring in things like um, priority and preemption um, so that some of those real-time services can actually run over a pool of unlicensed spectrum. Um, so important to track. And the other, the other thing that very uh, 3GPP-focused operators keep forgetting is ecosystem. So if you look at the, uh, the projection in terms of global devices supporting Wi-Fi 6 or 802.11ax versus 5G NR, we're still going to be in a world where there's ubiquitous Wi-Fi connectivity in all devices, but only a selected number of devices are actually going to support cellular technologies. So if you think about all the Internet of Things, um, still laptops, um, tablets, light bulbs, whatever, still that IEEE ecosystem uh, will rule in that case. So that's why service providers really need to have a, um, you know, a foot in both camps for their strategy. So this will be a typical uh, HetNet hierarchy IFSC in the next one to two years. Um, so we will see rapid uh, refarming off 3G. Um, again, in uh, Korea and Japan, they're already shutting down or have shut down their 3G networks. 3G is a 1990s technology in terms of voice. Uh, very inefficient. So rapid refarming of getting all the voice traffic onto Volti as, as sort of a hotspot, and then refarming of all the old 3G bands if they haven't already to LTE. So you'll typically see the, the low and mid bands. The low band is your coverage continuity, particularly for voice and IoT. Your mid bands is your metro capacity. 
your 5G C-band will be your supplementary capacity. So basically as, uh, as apps demand it, it'll ramp up and down. When it's not required or the phone's in idle mode, it'll camp back down on LTE typically. Uh, I've mentioned, you know, Wi-Fi as you know well today in the 5 gig band. Millimeter wave, you're looking at those fixed wireless access point to multi-point deployments and hotspot capacity, particularly indoors. Um, so in areas like this, there will be millimeter wave small cells. Um, and there was quite a lot of work happening, um, particularly things like Facebook, um, telegraphy and projects like that, looking at the 60 gig unlicensed as well. So some extra complex complexity in the RAN, um, but also a little bit of consolidation um, as people look to shut down 3G. Okay, so what's happening in the core? Kind of state of the play today. Um, it's really ultimately about you know, virtualization and um, automation in the core. We've been on this journey for about three to four years. It's fairly mature now. There's still some work to be done, particularly around lifecycle management of the full uh, NFV stack. The challenge with 5G, and this is where we're just bringing in some new technology to bear, is how do we get multi-gigabit or terabit throughput through a virtual packet core? Um, so technologies like vector packet processing um, basically, although we've got to drive common off-the-shelf hardware, we have to do tricks in the software to get better performance out of it. And the 5G so-called NSA implementation, this is now mature. So this was the 3GPP release 15 uh, spec that came out last year. Certainly in terms of Cisco's production code, uh, we have this deployed in a number of networks and it's hardened and it's ready to go. So 5G non-standalone on a virtual packet core, done, ready to go, carrier grade. Phase one. Phase two starts to get a bit tricky. So what phase two, as a reminder, is the, is the idea of custom services. This is kind of what a lot of your product teams are really interested in. So 5G, where should we go? We need to follow the money, the, the mega trends. And the mega trends that everyone will talk about is obviously the workloads moving to the cloud um, from on-prem and everything going mobile. Nothing new there. How do we actually capture the, those two trends? The other thing we see is going after that Sounds great, but if you actually, this is just one study, if you look across the verticals and if you look across the actual services they're going to want to run, every, every single vertical has a different custom requirement. And then if you think about this matrix, if you go within a vertical, you know, transport and logistics, and you look at all the different industries below that, they'll all want something different as well. So what I really take away from this is that we don't really know what these verticals need. And, and service providers can't go out there and define a service and think with certain traits and try and put it out there as a product. It has to work the other way around. We have to and, uh, expose from our network all the new 5G capabilities and let them pick and choose. Right? This is not, not going to be a buffet anymore. It has to be a la carte. They have to say, I want three of those, four of those, one of those and I want to pay that much, and I want to click enable, and it happens. It, it's kind of a vision, but the reality is we're not going to be able to tap any of those revenue streams if we don't make it happen. So for the network, um, we do need to look at what's happening in RAN. Uh, we definitely need to, to open that up. That's the only way we're going to be able to create more of these custom services. Uh, we have to look at control and user plane separation uh, in the core. We have to look at API exposure, and I'll talk a bit more about with a new product we've just launched here. Uh, the network has to become much more of a fabric. Again, these are the sessions tomorrow, and the, uh, the automation data center and security as well. Okay, so open, open VRAN or open RAN status of the market is interesting at the moment in, in radio access. Um, you know, we, we've had... When I started doing mobility with 2G, I think there were um, 10 RAN vendors. Um, you know, if you think of the Lucents and Nortels and Motorola's, and, and I used to work for Philips. I don't know if everyone remembers, but Philips actually had a, uh, a GSM product. 
We're now down to three or four, and, and certain of those options are being, you know, for, for different reasons, being banned in, in certain markets as well. At the same, so, so that's bad, you know, that's really bad for the industry, but what it has done is it's opened up this interesting innovation gap for startups to come in. And these startups see opening up of the RAN to becoming more software defined as an opportunity. Um, so, you know, in places like Silicon Valley, uh, in Israel, in Europe, there are people looking at, well, if I create a software-defined radio, what can I do with it? Um, you know, that, so there, there's an architectural optimization there. Um, there's the ability to actually disaggregate. You know, disaggregation is not just so much about driving your hardware down to a commodity platform. Uh, but what it means from a management perspective is you can manage the life cycle of your hardware and your software separately. So traditionally, um, a baseband unit or a modem, you could get two generations out of it if you are lucky. So say it was designed for 3G, you could software upgrade it to 4G, but it starts to creak, right? It would start to hit performance limits, so you may have to reduce the number of cells that you have homed per BBU, but it would never do 5G. Um, once software and hardware is disaggregated, yeah, software upgrade the VNF to support 5G, and at the same time, your hardware, your NFVI, can go through its own life cycle. So every time there is a new high-performance chipset or there's more memory required, you know, you can swap out those servers. Uh, you know, hopefully they're fairly cheap. Put them in, or you can just add racks. Out of the way. So this is this is really revolutionary when you look at the amount of spend that goes into the RAN today. And, and the Rakuten use case is an interesting one because I know the CTO has publicly mentioned the proportion of TCO saving he's going to get out of his RAN uh, by following, following this approach. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, but the other aspect really I see coming in is this, this idea of these custom services. So what I really like about it is if we had a common CU, or effectively common software layer um, in my network, I can have a different hardware solution from a different vendor who specializes in different areas. So I could have my RUs for my macro network from the person who has the best radios and the best massive MIMO uh, performance uh, in the market. But I might want to go after um, a mine site, right? So I need a hardened, certified uh, radio for that environment. I can do that. I can still bring it back to the same software and the same management plane. I might want to go and do the, uh, the MCG uh, or, or the Tokyo Olympics. So I'm going to go after a specialist DAS company that has the best radio and the best distribution in the market. Again, I can do that but it doesn't change anything in terms of my management, in terms of my song further in the network. So I think, you know, Open VRAN has a really important play in terms of these, these custom services as we go forward as well. Okay, so the core, uh, as we move down the stack, we've got to do a few more things. We do have to separate the control plane from the user plane um, so that we can uh, create these user planes that have different characteristics. So I'm going to want one user plane for voice, I'm going to want another user plane for my IoT traffic, I'm going to want another user plane for um, just my smartphones. And even within the smartphone traffic, I might say all my social media is going to go on one user plane, like I mentioned, about different resiliency, different architectures. Um, whereas all my enterprise VPN traffic, I want to go through a different path in my network. Um, I also now need to open it up. So, I, I can't, like I said, you can't just put products out to market anymore. We're going to need to move to a world where an enterprise can just pick and choose uh, what they want. Which brings me on to our um, the announcement we made at MWC. I think um, Samir and Michael mentioned it this morning. It's called the Unified uh, Domain Center. Um, Basically, the, the way to think of it is a single pane of glass for enterprises to provision mobile services. Um, so there are some provisioning platforms today, like Cisco Jasper, 
where they, they have very crude control. They can go in um, and they can provision a user, they can set restrictions in terms of how much they're consuming. Um, that's about it. it. It's very crude. They're either on or off. Really, they have no visibility of what's happening over uh, that mobile extension. So the idea here is, is a single pane of glass, regardless of where the user is, on-prem, off-prem, on mobile, regardless of where they're consuming their services, private cloud, uh, public cloud, uh, give the, the IT manager uh, that network assurance. So this is a little bit more about what it looks like. Um, DNA Center is our enterprise assurance uh, control platform we have today in the enterprise domain. Um, they now have a new window where they can go effectively and open it up and they can provision um, policy uh, restrictions back into the, the mobile domain. So when you think about it, it's kind of they can do things like they can do a group to say these are all my IoT devices that are, that are sitting on my SP network. Uh, these are all my um, smartphone devices. I don't want anyone who's got an IoT platform from um, going anywhere on social media, you know, other than this defined path in my network. And if there's any violation of that, I want to I know about it. Um, I want my smartphone users in uh, Victoria or a, a certain geographical region uh, to only be able to use these devices for these times of the day, or maybe it's. Uh, um, you know, a, a bulletin board or an information kiosk or something like that. And the beauty here is that, um, you know, from an SP perspective, we've got trust because we've got trust in the architecture, standards-based architecture. Um, we've got assurance. We can put limits on what they can do. So we know they're not going to break the network, but we are handing over control. So um, I recommend you, if you get over to the world of solutions, we have a, a demo of this. So you can see what the user experience looks like and how this works. Um, and this really is starting to talk about that idea of those, those custom 5G services. OK, so my, my final phase is uh, moving to the edge. And um, so firstly, again, what is the business model here? Um, Santana will go through this in more detail because it's still evolving. Um, the way I like to look at it, the, the move to the edge and mech is there are kind of three flavors of conversation we're having with service providers. The first is effectively not even around new services, is what is the optimization opportunity or in terms of the savings in my network today. I have pain points in my network with my current architecture um, that could potentially be solved if I can break traffic out at some other point, where, wherever that point may be. Um, and this is just one survey in terms of what are the MEC use cases. And you can see the green ones essentially are about, I've got infrastructure today, but I see an opportunity to either lower cost or improved user experience. And mainly they are around video. You know, how do I get an alignment in terms of my CDN and my caching uh, today? The second phase is, well, actually for existing services, you know, how can I improve that? Maybe there is some monetization opportunities um, around venue, about being more context aware. Maybe AR, VR starts to come into play and I do need uh, a little bit lower latency. Uh, and then the third ones are really out there, you know, more around the super low latency, the ultra-reliable ultra low latency services that you have, like mission critical, um, IoT, smart buildings, et cetera. Go back. So how do we get to the edge? Um, you know, so, so here we've already implemented CUPS. We now need to look at actually moving that user plane further in. We obviously got to look at the whole edge infrastructure, um, which you'll hear about next. Uh, again, we've got to take from a fairly primitive API type um, portal, which I showed you before, to more of what uh, more service-based architecture, so one that is more dynamic in terms of network slicing, et cetera. Um, and we need to take the core beyond just VMs. We need to take it to a cloud-native um, microservice-based mode so that we can adapt and change the network much more dynamically and implement um, CICD. Um, so for the packet core, you know, cloud native, which I'll talk about, um, and, you know, 
local breakout are the two considerations we need to bring in. Um, so why cloud native? We, we do get this question quite a lot. You know, like it seems like we've only just moved all of our network workloads onto OpenStack and VMware and into VMs, and we're just learning about that. And now, Cisco, you're coming and telling me that we need to go a step further and actually start breaking those workloads up into microservices and start looking at a new approach. Um, but it, it's where we need to go in a 5G world. It's about the speed in terms of which we can adapt to traffic loads. Um, your product teams can generate services much faster. Uh, it's obviously in terms of the efficiency, in, in terms of um, redundant capacity that we want to um, reduce, how we can scale, you know, so it's a terabit speeds, and ultimately how we can move stuff around. So, you know, the edge at some point will even go on-prem. You know, so the edge will, your SP edge will go into your, um, your mobile SP edge will go into the enterprise. So we can't do that today and just keep firing up VMs where, you know, we need to be adaptable. It may have to go on bare metal, um, whereas in the core network, it may even go to public cloud. Um, so the cloud native journey, you'll hear more about tomorrow, tomorrow with uh, Abhishek. Um, but effectively, Cisco has a, you know, a very big team focused on how we, we take this journey and how we map the network workloads and how we create the operational practices um, around that. Okay, um, service-based architecture. I'm not sure how many of you follow 3GPP and um, it's amazing how many acronyms they can generate in such a short time. And every time I look at 3GPP, there are, seem to be more functions being added. Really, all, we, all you need to think about is the fact that for a long time, our, our service enablers, so our policy, getting things like location awareness out of our networks, uh, even things like the billing platforms themselves, have been very rigid. Um, they are, they've, they've been very bespoke. There's a hub-spoke architecture, you know, using diameter in terms of signaling. We've always had issues in terms of signaling storms and things like that in the framework. What 3GPP is trying to do is to create an IT type of infrastructure for all the service and elements. So all the policy, uh, all the slice control, uh, the API exposure elements, creating them, uh, moving them to a, an HTTP uh, um, kind of framework means that we can bring services on and off much more quickly. They can be from multi-vendors. We can actually do things like spin them up, test them in a safe environment without them impacting the network and moving forward. So there's still quite a lot of work to be done here. This is much of the focus of 3GPP release 16. Um, but it is required for that ultimate, that third step of the journey um, that I mentioned. Okay, so in conclusion, um, look, 5G, the one thing to take away is 5G, there's huge opportunity, but there's huge challenge. And the reason there's huge challenge is because all those services that we need to capture are so vast and they're so diverse. It does have end-to-end -end impacts, and I think last year, I think vendors as a whole were pretty much scaring SPs about how much change was required in the network. So hopefully today I've, I've provided a bit more of a, a stepwise approach. Um, First, we need to look at just opening up the pipe. Then we need to look at, you know, how are those services being delivered? How can we customize them? Um, and then, you know, unless you're building a greenfield network, we now, you know, need to consider how we move to the edge. Uh, virtualization and automation is, I won't say it's all there, but it's pretty mature. The question is, how do you scale that? So how do you put 20 times more capacity through that infrastructure? Um, Intent-based networking, policy and security, so have a look at the world of solutions. We, are, we need to find a way, and we think we've, we've come up with quite a good framework for how we can really enable network as a service moving forward. Um, and edge dis distribution and cloud native kind of go hand in hand, and um, hopefully that's a good segue uh, to my colleague. Um, so with that, you know, are there any questions around what I've said? Does it make sense? Um, or am I 
So we've got uh, some time for questions. And by the way, um, we will share the slides. Just make sure that when you do come in, uh, you get your, uh, your passes uh, registered. Uh, there'll be a lady zapping, zapping it for you. So um, any questions? We've got some time for questions. We've got Ji Hyang with the mic. All right, here you go. We've got the first question. If you can just introduce yourself, that'd be great. Um, Yep. Okay, Marcellus from the Fiber Star. It's a fiber network actually. If we are looking for this technology, we must is a unify uh, brand actually, because if we want, we want to doing the slicing and other things, and we have different brand, it's also make us difficult. But we must go, want to go to there. How do you think for? I don't know. You have a other brands also collaboration or something like that so you can doing this in the future because until today because our DWDM is different our IP network and MPRS but even in the age for example FTT is also different yep. and mobile aggregation also different our, our cloud also different our CDN also different brands something like that so how to integrate that is something crazy <laughs> Yeah, it's look the, the, the idea of end to end slicing's got a long long way to go. Um, so three G P P are only covering the core and the node B, the radio. And what I think the cue we can take from that though and that service based architecture is we are gonna get out of three G P um, a slicing let's call it a slicing identification mechanism. So beyond what we have today, which is just a quas QCI mapping, we're going to get a, a slice selection indicator. And that slice selection indicator you know, can almost be infinite in terms of its variance. Now, how, when you look at the network overall, what you do with that you know, has to translate. Obviously, it has to translate into your IP network. You have to decide what that means. Is it, is it a, um, and that's where I'm, I'm not an expert, but plenty of my colleagues are and then how it translates into your optical um, and that right through. So I'd, I, yeah, I think w I hear you and I think we all understand that end-to-end -end slicing has got a long, long way to go. Um, the only thing I do like is now, at least for mobile, we'll at least have something to work with um, moving forward. Or maybe you want to cover that one as well. Yeah, too. have you got, you're running MPLS today? Okay, so you've got the concept of multi-tenancy in your network. So I think when you talk about slicing, you know, slicing is, is quite a broad term. Um, so uh, I don't think there's a definition in terms of, hey, look, what mechanism you use for slicing, okay? So from a network perspective today, you've already doing slicing from an MPLS perspective. Is it hard slicing? Is it soft slicing? How do we then combine it all together? That's where the orchestration comes in, yeah. So I think be happy to actually uh, work, uh, talk to you offline because we are also doing some work of stitching that together from an orchestration perspective and also tying into the mobile side as well. Mm. So that's something that we're definitely uh, working on and working towards. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Yep, over there. Uh, I'm Anihar from uh, Reliance Geo India. Uh, so much talk about, you know, the data with 5G. What happens to voice? Any improvement, quality improvement that we are looking at? Any idea? So, um, when I showed my hierarchical rat structure, um, you know, so voice, voice technically can run over anything. But um, I probably didn't cover it in the spectrum view. But in the next three to five years, I think voice will sit on LTE. Um, for, not for your case, but for other networks where there's 3G, they will do that rapid uh, migration and that'll fix some of the issues with Volte today because they'll get much more contiguous coverage. Um, and then the 5G is purely going to be on the data side, particularly for the non-standalone deployment. Um, once LTE spectrum starts to get refarmed, then that's when they will look at um, voice. So. The only, my only customer who is, we're, we're looking at voice over 5G today is T-Mobile in the US because they have some 600 meg spectrum. Um, so this is the second digital dividend. Um, maybe in, in India, if we do get 600 meg opening up, 
you know, it's got coverage continuity, so we will look to put voice on a 5G uh, waveform. So it's, but for now, I think it's all going to be Vaulty. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep. One in the back. Looks like you're getting all the questions today. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not too hard. Check. Yep. Yep. Uh, my name is Adi Yuda from uh, Dimension Data Indonesia, Solution Architect. Yep. Uh, in terms of the coextensi between uh, 5G and small cells, do you see any significance by deploying it on the Asia market uh, in terms of the potential dollar value? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, uh, I know everything comes back to spectrum. If it's millimeter wave that comes out, it's perfect for small cells because you know, you're you're probably going to get line of sight maximum 200 meter range at a millimeter wave. Um, but, you know, in Korea, every operator got 800 megs of spectrum. So to put that in context, um, an average operator today has 200 megs or less. So in one foul swoop, they got four times more spectrum, you know, way more than what's available for Wi-Fi. So, <laughs> Perfect for small cells, um, you know, because you've got massive bandwidth and it's suited in terms of RF propagation as well. Uh, but spectrum is one of the constraints? Um, well, well I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, I'm not sure about Indonesia, the timing for millimeter wave, I think I had it on the... 60 gigahertz. Sorry? 60 gigahertz. Ah, uh, yeah. 60 gigahertz is already unlicensed. It's already unlicensed, yeah, yeah. yeah. 60 gigs, not so good. You can't use it outdoors. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if, if it's between 20 and, and 40 gigahertz, then, yes, small cells is a very good initial deployment model. If it's C-band, um, if you've already got LTE small cells, yes, because it's, it's more bandwidth. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily open up small cells uh, as a new use case straight off. I can talk to you offline because, I, I, yeah, it would be good to get a sense of for Indonesia. I think you're, you, you don't have any 3.5 gig either, do you, satellite in there? Yeah, you're a bit stuck. Okay, thanks. What's any up? questions? Okay, once again, as I said, you can always see Andrew. Grab him, or you want to set up time, just go to the, to the desk in front. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you all. Thank you.